And welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable. This is your host Shane Bailey and after the day we've had today, we all deserve a little drink. <laughs> little little weather here in the Nashville area. A strange uh, week of uh, scheduling has created a very late week podcast for us. So we apologize if you are anxious to get this podcast, all three of you. Uh, we apologize that it's taken an extra day or two to get this posted, but uh, we promise we're going to get it up tonight, Thursday, so no need to wait any longer, just in time to listen to it tomorrow to recap uh, some extra basketball while you're watching some NCAA tournament action. But I uh, want to get started and, and cover, our, uh, we'll make some introductions and do, then cover our housekeeping issues, and that way I can have a drink. Blair, Smiley, welcome. Good to be back. Appreciate you having me here. We're glad to have you. We've got a newcomer to the round table. An Ole Miss fan. Go to hell, Ole Miss. Yes. <laughs> like you could say, say hell, right? You could say hell. Uh, at least we're, we're saying it tonight, apparently. Because <laughs> I'm not going to edit that part out. Um, it, it's, it's part of your cheer. You say it at the, at the game, so it, it's got to be acceptable, I think. That's right. Cole Hodges, welcome to the SEC Sports Roundtable. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. Well, we're glad to have you. I still didn't get my drink in, so I had to get that out of the way. But uh, well, let's get some housekeeping issues taken care of real quick, and then we can get on with uh, the rest of the podcast. We're going to go fly blind, as they, call, as they say. Uh, we have no Internet access. We had a big thunderstorm come through the Nashville area and apparently has knocked out Comcast's horrible service. Uh, the most unreliable next to AT&T, uh, which is I can't even get on my 3G today to, to check out our brackets to double check our, our work. So we don't need any comments from anyone that might be listening saying we got something wrong because we're going from memory here. We have no fact checking capabilities whatsoever. And uh, that's just the way we're doing it tonight. We're going to get one out. Hell or high water. There's that word again. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, you can find us on Facebook at SEC Sports Roundtable. We're on Stitcher Radio. Look for SEC Sports Roundtable there. We are also on iTunes. If you search SEC Sports, I know we're up right near the top of that search uh, under SEC Sports Roundtable. Our Twitter account is SEC SRT. Uh, you could just go to the website at secsrt.com. Uh, you can catch all the information there as well. Uh, don't forget on Facebook, if that's the only way you like to follow us or find us, uh, that you can actually stream the video and the um, audio versions of this podcast uh, that we get. So you can also get this on YouTube. That's where the video is coming from. At uh, YouTube channel is SECSRT. That's all the ways that you can find us today. Um, maybe that will grow in the future. Who knows? But uh, that's lots of ways to, to find us and listen. So we try to make it as easy as, easy as possible. Uh, for you guys to take a listen and, and see what's going on with the uh, SEC Sports Roundtable podcast. But let's get straight into some of the conversations here. Uh, we had a little basketball this past week, and uh, for anyone that's a fan, even the casual fan starts to get excited about basketball starting last week. I mean, you have the main uh, big six, as we you know refer to in the football arena. Um, conferences all had their tournaments over the weekend including the SEC, and so we're, we'll, we'll recap a little bit of the uh, SEC men's tournament action that took place in New Orleans, and then we'll uh, take a look at uh, the week ahead. The brackets are out, the games are being played, have some winners and losers in both the NIT and the, uh, I guess, no losers in the tournament yet, only two teams are, are playing, so we'll cover some of that as well, and uh, who knows, I think there's some coaching talk that we'll, we'll hit upon as well. So let's let's start off talking about the weekend's games from from the SEC. What what did you take away? Anything? Well, I took away um, a trip to Tampa. Yeah, uh, I was uh, on vacation and uh, and got a lot of uh, uh, text messaging and um, Twitters from from the family that was in New Orleans with the SEC tournament, but. Uh, uh, obviously, for me, the SEC tournament kind of went downhill after the uh, Thursday evening game where Mississippi State showed up in the game where they needed to win and uh, play against Georgia and kind of come back from a little bit of a binge, uh, uh, a loss earlier in the year, and they just came out with no energy and just pretty much played one of the worst games they played all year, and Georgia just seems to be a bad matchup for them. So, so you ended up – 
I mean, we might get a little ahead of ourselves, but you lost there, you lost in the NIT. So is that, what, six of seven? It was uh, seven of the last nine. Seven of the last nine. And, yeah. and that's we were 19 and five at uh, one point. We were 19 and five uh, with number 15th in the country, probably about a five seed. And we lost seven of nine. So we're 21 and 14. Is that what my math does right? No, that's obviously not right. We'll just go with whatever that is. We'll go with seven of the last nine. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, I thought five going, and five and seven is twelve. Yeah. I thought going into the 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 day that um, the first game, which I believe was LSU and Arkansas, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. I thought that was going to be the most competitive game, and uh, and it was. I think all right. I didn't get to watch a little bit of it, but um, you know, Georgia and Mississippi State ended up being kind of a, as competitive as any of the games. Um, there because Ole Miss kind of pulled away from Auburn at the end. And um, I think Alabama was at South Carolina wasn't even really all that close. So, yeah. um, you know, the first day nobody really talks about it anyway. Everybody's just getting in and going to Mother's and getting red beans and rice and a side of ham or something. Right? And 70% and of the tickets were, were for a team that hadn't even played yet. Right. So That's the way it goes. It's the SEC. <clears throat> Well, the, we'll just go straight into the second day of action. And Kentucky actually had had a little trouble with LSU for a little while, but I think finally took care of what they needed to there and, and proved that they were what we thought they were going to be. Uh, that, that proved us wrong later down the week. But And you brought that up, mm. at, you know, a couple podcasts yeah. ago that, you know, as this tournament comes into to fruition that Vanderbilt was going to, come into their own at the right time, and, and they did. They, they faced a Georgia team, if I'm remembering correctly, and I'm looking down at my own – I'm going to paper notes there. They, and they pretty much handled Georgia. Yes. I mean, there was – from the beginning, Vanderbilt mm -hmm. took control of that game and, and never had any huge issues uh, with that game leading up to the Ole Miss-Tennessee yeah. game. And, Cole, you might want to talk a little bit about that, being a – a rebel? Yes, I was actually. And, and in, in my world, you're still rebels. Yes, you know? yes, not not rebel, rebel bears, not, not rebel, rebel black bears, yeah. or anything like that that Mr. Boone would like us to call ourselves. But uh, basically, I was actually playing my basketball game myself that night, so I didn't get to see much of it, but caught uh, caught the very end, which turned out to be good. It was a very competitive game. I don't believe anybody had a larger lead than three yeah. for the most part, all the way through regulation. Uh, up until the very end where Ole Miss pulled ahead at the end of regulation and uh, decided to start shooting free throws like we've shot free throws the whole year long. Tennessee picked up on that, missed some free throws, and then Skylar McBee hit a bank three to uh, throw, it into, throw it into overtime. Uh, in overtime, uh, the Rebels came out hot, which was great. Most of the time when you, when you suffer a shot like that and get forced into overtime, the team that, the team that was up at the end – doesn't come out and uh, they lose that momentum exactly. But they came out and Tennessee seemed to uh, you know lose a little momentum. Uh, Ole Miss took advantage, went up by seven, and you know was able to close it out. So it was great. It was a great great win for us. Uh, very fortunate. Uh, bad call by the refs. Probably uh, some Vol fans that are listening in might think that, but uh, I believe the Rebels uh, deserve the win and uh, moved on to play Vandy on Saturday. Yeah. Let me ask you, do you think if they would have lost, they wouldn't have even been invited to the NIT? It's a great possibility. Because um, I consider them, if you want to think of a bubble team on the NIT, that was Ole Miss. It could have been. It could have been. I think the Tennessee win and the way they played for uh, three-fourths of the game against Vandy definitely uh, definitely got them the seed they, they got, which ended up being a number two seed in the NIT. Uh, Might have been a little high if you ask my Mississippi State friend, but um, – but, uh, it all uh, it all worked out for us. I thought we played really well. We played really great during the at the end of the stretch. Yeah. We had some good wins. Um, yeah, you won your last three regular mm -hmm. season, then you won the two games, and um, not to interrupt, but I mean that was what well, we actually got in the conversation with our Tennessee man, Mr. Schultz, the last time that uh, he, I was trying to say that if they won that Auburn game, that was going to be four in a row, and uh, and Ole Miss had the length. They had – Ole Miss, the weird thing about them was is that when they came with energy and played for 40 minutes and they were somewhat hitting shots, they're difficult to play against because they have just mismatch opportunities across the board. They just have guys that, you know, you got a Terrence Henry that's, you know, 6'8", 6'9", that can 
play a two spot. Mm -hmm. I mean, if need be, you know, he guarded D Boss. Mm -hmm. I mean, for crying out loud. So um, I knew that that was going to be a tough matchup, and I knew with them playing that, that you know, some of those times you you wonder how that that first game on the second day for that team that got the bye, how they're going to come out. Are they going to come out a little bit lulled? And if you've got a team that's finished the game, the, the end of the season like Ole Miss did, carries that into the first game, then they're kind of rolling. They're kind of in this tempo. Um, so that's the thing that I was wondering about. And, and for Vandy, I mean, when you were talking about Vandy earlier, I mean, how great was that to be sitting in the hotel in New Orleans and going, oh, we're going to play Georgia and not Mississippi yeah. State. And, uh, you know, as terrible as states play, they're just – at any point in time, they could have turned the switch and, you know, they can be dominating. And so – Getting a Georgia matchup, I think, was a good thing for them. Well, if, and then to turn around and not have to play Tennessee, and now you got to play Ole Miss, I mean, they lined up very well. If you look at the bracket before the games actually started and you looked at one, the two yeah. best teams, Vanderbilt and Kentucky, and you looked at their road, Vanderbilt actually had the rougher way because Ole Miss finished the season hot. Tennessee, for the most part, yeah. finished their season on the roll. You also had a Mississippi State team who, like you said, lost 7-9, and nine, but was still a talented team, a top 15 mm -hmm. team at one point during the season who had the pieces put yeah. together that if they played correctly, you didn't want to have yeah. to play them. So if you look at the matchups, Vanderbilt actually had the toughest road to get yeah. to the finals in the SEC championship game. It didn't work. You know, some of the pieces didn't happen that way for mm -hmm. them, and it ended up being even easier. Um, but, you know, they had a tougher way than, than Kentucky, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And they, you know, like like y'all said, you know, they could have played Tennessee in that uh, that round of four, that final round of four. They got Ole Miss. They got all all Ole Miss could give to them for about three-fourths of the game. Right. And then uh, John Jenkins just hit just hit a couple threes, and Vandy was able to capitalize yeah. on it. I mean, that's the whole deal is when you catch that team that's on their third day, then the team that – struggled to get through that first day you know it's it's a yeah. total different deal i mean so you knew at some point that you know vanderbilt and with their experience was going to be able to probably pull away and that's exactly what happened uh with regards to it and, and one of the things that we talked about and i think we even talked with john was that tennessee probably would have been better served if florida could have beat kentucky and they would have played that first day yeah. uh, if they would have done that and had a chance to have an extra win or win in the SEC tournament, the chances of going to the NCAA, NCAA tournament would have, to me, greatly increased, and they would have, I think they would have been one of the first four um, in, or the last yeah. four in. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, as opposed to, you know, ending up in the NIT and yeah. destroyed by Oregon by 20. So, you know, whether they would have gotten destroyed by 20 by another opponent in the NCAA tournament or not, that's, yeah. that's never going to be known, but at least it would have been the tournament and not the NIT. But, you know, for, for Tennessee, for them to be as happy as they were going into the tournament to be a number two seed, that was probably the worst thing that could have happened to them. Yeah, and, I mean, when you looked at it on paper, I mean, obviously that bottom half of the bracket, the 2-3 with Tennessee and Vandy, I mean, that was the weaker side of the bracket when you looked at it because you have, you know, you got Tennessee, Florida, and all you know Alabama on the top line. And... So you knew that that was going to be, you know, you didn't want to be in that side. You didn't want to be in the side with Florida or Kentucky. So that was the that was the whole kicker. If they would have had that extra day, that might have that might have helped them out. But uh, I, I just had a feeling that Ole Miss was going to give them a a good run. They were just playing well. Yeah, and, I mean, well, if you look at it, that would if they would have. You could have, would have, should have thing, yeah. but if they would have ended up not making it, they would have been what a four yeah. seed, mm -hmm. and so the four, the four seed, the way this matches up, would have they would have been playing Florida spot. Yeah, they would yeah. have played Alabama. They'd, yeah, and <laughs> which have been just as hard. I mean, you never know what Alabama's bringing to the table, but you know that top side of the bracket. I think you know it was what Alabama and Florida, and then Kentucky and LSU, right? Yeah, the the, the right. second day yeah. when when games really started to matter. And that Florida Alabama game, we said, you know, obviously, I mean, that was just a nail biter. Went all the way down, pretty much to the wire, to the very yeah. end. And Florida squeaked through, ended up playing Kentucky. Yeah, and that was a good game. They played very, Florida, from what I remember. Florida played really well. I, I, Kentucky pulled their last five minutes. You mm -hmm. know, it goes on a six zero run that just makes you want to punch every one of them in the face, or something like that. Well, I think if I, I, I'm going by memory here, but they kind of the Kentucky game flip flop from the the semis to the finals because 
Didn't, did, did Florida not just go cold that last four or five minutes and not really make a basket? Yeah. Yes, that's right. And, and Kentucky, and stretched it out and Kentucky did the same yeah. in the finals. They, they, they learned from Florida, apparently. They spent too much time watching that tape of Florida. But you know, I mean, it was, you know, I caught the, the last end of, you know, the last eight minutes of the Kentucky Vandy game. And, it, and I believe with about eight minutes left, Kentucky had like a five point lead. And then with five minutes, it was either like a five or six point lead, and then Vandy kind of worked over a two minute period and kind of got it back to you know one point ball game, whatever it was. I mean, five minutes to go. Yeah, Kentucky was up by seven yeah. at one point and with five to go. Was yeah, with five, five to, to go, go. I mean, Vandy just took over the game. It was really impressive. Um, and, and a you're freshman, right. yeah. and a freshman, you know. And what did and I say? That. I told I, I I said that about two po- podcasts ago that those two guards played. And they got to have that because Tinsley doesn't bring you the athleticism that those guys do. He's smart, but when you get to the end of the game scenarios, you needed somebody who's going to be able to create something, um, you know, because Jenkins and Taylor. and Taylor, the wing players, it's hard to get on the ball when you're down, you know, unless they actually have the ball. But uh, I thought they played well. I, I, I was excited to kind of see them pull off that victory because I think they needed it. Um, as a team, <laughs> I mean that's a that's really for Vanderbilt. That's the monkey off the back. I mean, yeah, what, if you look at Vandy over the last what their their run as far as tournament actions last four years. Last would you four say? years, lost in the first round. The last three years, I believe, yeah. until today. The last two years, they didn't get there three years oh, ago. Uh, yeah. But like in 07, if you go back to 07, they lost to Sienna. So so we'll look at the last. Stallings five years. hadn't had a first round win. Hadn't won won an SEC championship yep. since 1941. Yeah. So I mean. You know, th- this is a team that has not – is not – even though they're one of the most experienced teams in all of the NCAA, they're the least tournament-tested yeah. team to have that kind of experience yeah. um, and, and talent yeah. that's that's probably out there. If you take those two combinations, there's probably other teams that are just as senior-laden yeah. um, but don't have as much tournament action, but they're not as good. But you look at the talent with the, the tournament action that they've had, getting knocked out of the first round, uh, you know, every year except one where they didn't make it since 07, yeah. being able to get that monkey off their back, make it to the SEC championship game, that's one of the even few times. I don't know the statistics or the time they the last time they've even been to the championship yeah. game. 51, I think yeah. I remember them saying. Yeah. For the championship game. For the championship game. game. Yeah. So not only the championship, but the championship game for Vanderbilt. For them to come in and do that yeah. and not only win, but to beat the number one overall team in the NCAA tournament bracket, they, yeah. they were able to keep that. Being able to do that really catapulted Vanderbilt's um, confidence level. I think. Oh, yeah. And, and, oh, definitely. And, and you're going to see – I think you're going to see that. And I think you saw it against yeah. Harvard. Yeah. Because uh, that's a team that matched up well for, for – even though the seed numbers don't don't show that. Um, that match, They matched up well against Vanderbilt. And yeah. Vanderbilt took care of that pretty easily today. Uh, it's, they made it interesting at the end. They did. Yeah, but, uh, you know, that was the whole thing. You know, we talked about this the last podcast. Well, but was, even up to the uh, couple minutes yeah. left in the first half, it was like 27-30. Yeah. I mean, it was yeah. it was pretty close. Yeah. they. Th- that's what we talked about the last time was how they just couldn't finish games. In 12 out of 13, I think it was 12 out of 13 years, Stalins, they had lost the last game of the year going into the SEC tournament. And they just hadn't played well in the SEC tournament. They just had never. And they did you know, that A couple this year of years too. ago, yeah, and a couple of years ago, they, they went a couple of games into it, but they didn't make it to the finals. But um, for them to make that run, and I think it really set up well for them to play the Georgia, kind of get that, you know, kind of that easy kind of win and kind of get a little momentum and then be able to play an Ole Miss team that you know you're playing on three days rest, then bam. You know, now you're in the championship game and you really, you know, you really could take it from there. Yeah, and they they had played Kentucky very well the first two times they played. So they had the experience to go into that game. And it was just really great to see those seniors and seeing Kevin Stallings after the game, after they won and they beat Kentucky. I didn't watch that part. (laughs) I'm sure you didn't. But it was great. It was great to see his emotion because you know that all that – Hard work they put in, and they had a lot of preseason expectations for that yeah. team. Yeah, and that was the thing. They were, I mean, they were top six team <clears throat> preseason. Yes. Yeah, and and how you know they were top seven. I mean, they were seventh in the country when they started the year in preseason. You know, so it's like, you know, I mean, they were there. I mean, and they're you know they were picked, and uh, I think we actually see that with their seeding that they've got in the NCAA tournament and being lucky to fall in the Syracuse bracket with all of their issues with losing that player, but. Uh, 
I mean, uh, that player being Fab Mello. Yeah. 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 yeah whatever. <laughs> Northeast basketball, who cares? But it was also good to see Vandy come out today because everybody always knows a five always loses to a 12 in the yeah. NCAA tournament. And yeah. I think they, you know, <clears throat> and that's a scary as, spot because yeah, as if, much as you hear that, as yeah. much as you hear that, that starts weighing on your mind. And how many times was Vandy a five when they lost? Exactly. A, a yeah. couple of those times were, they were a five. Seed. Yeah. I mean, and, and the whole thing was, I mean, Stallings is the one that said it last year. You know, when, it, when the game got close, they got tight last year. Um, and, you know, when Richmond, you know, just got that game close. They just got tight. And Stallings, you know, he, I think he did a good job of trying to eliminate that. Um, and I thought he did a pretty good job this year, even though they had their hiccups. But, you know, I think their biggest problem this year was Festus Azili not being the player that he was at the end of last year and still being hurt and having a harder time coming over the injury. And now getting healthy. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, but I mean, I was listening to it on the radio over here and, you love it when the announcer says Festus a zeli, zeli. Oh, that was zeli. driving me nuts. A zeli. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm like, have you ever listened to anything? Yeah. It, it, it's That's not like, like really. It's not like we're talking about uh, a play-in team yeah. or whatever they call them, the first four. Yeah. It's not like it's a 16th yeah. seed team that. It's like Colorado State. <laughs> that, that's first appearance ever. It's, was it South Dakota State? Yeah. Their, their first appearance ever. It's not like you're looking at their roster. You're looking at a team that, that's got some, some great talent on it, and he can't pronounce the name. I heard that too, stuck in traffic on the interstate too. That's great. Um, but, you know, one thing that, that you notice with Vanderbilt to me is that. Let's let's take that Tennessee last game of the season and, and and forget about that one. We'll we'll give them a pass. They just they were mostly exhausted after that Florida game, but that game right there proved I think to the players that they have what it takes to to go far in a tournament action because that basically had a tournament feel to that game being in that was played at the O Dome, right? Is that where that yeah. one? Was? Yes. And so it was in Florida. Um, they. Had a had to battle the whole entire way through that, uh, and to to beat Florida there, uh, really set the stage for them to yeah. come into the SEC tournament and 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 finish like they're doing on a high note. And like we said, uh, we'd we'd love to go through the entire bracket, but uh, Comcast is not cooperating with us tonight, um, as far as our internet service. But you 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 nailed it. They're in the Syracuse bracket. Yeah. And Syracuse is an overall number one, and they had issues today. Yeah. Uh, against a 16th yeah. seed, mm-hmm. um, and I forgot who they were playing. UNC. UNC Asheville, Asheville. and yeah. they have a and they have a very very tough game on Saturday against Kansas State. Kansas yeah. State's long, athletic, loves to rebound. With Fab Mello being out. It's going to be tough. I mean, Missouri, and you can just ask Missouri. You know, they lost to uh, Kansas State twice this year, and Missouri's the number two, two seed in the Midwest or out west. I'm sorry. So, uh, you know, I think that that uh, Syracuse is going to have some trouble with Kansas State if they do get by Kansas State. The winner of the Wisconsin Vandy game is going to, you know, I think, will come out on top. I, I think, do too. And yeah. I think Vandy matches up with Wisconsin very well. Yes. You know, I, I'm, I, you know, I saw something the other day about John Jenkins that. It's pretty amazing. I mean, talking about SEC, like, history of players and how efficient they are. You know that he's like – I want to say it's a weird number, but it's under 13 shots a game he's averaged for his career. And he's and he's led the league in scoring in the last two years, I believe, or two out of the last three years. And they showed what – you know, because everybody would consider Chris Lofton as the best three-point shooter SEC-wise – over a career. Right. If he stayed next year, which he's probably not, he would blow Chris Lofton's, like, three-point made field goals by, like, over 75. Like, he's almost got the record yeah, what he, in what three he years. Had this, this year he had, he's what, got like 120, under, 125 yeah, yeah. or something? Threes? So he's got, like, under 50 to break the record right now. And mm-hmm. it was pretty crazy. They put Chris Lofton, like Chris Lofton basically, I think took like an 18.2 shots a game in his career. Um, and John Jenkins basically takes like under 13 shots. So five fewer. So this year, he yeah. So and he's five taking, fewer over 30 games, that's. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable how efficient he is. And it, and I didn't never, I never thought about that until that, I started looking at his stat lines. And his stat lines are always that's, like. That's 600 six, shots. Yeah. That's. Five, I'm, yeah. I, I, he's like six for slow. 11, seven for 11, or he's like seven for nine. I mean, he's if you look at it, it's pretty amazing. I think if you go back, maybe like a Chris Jackson or somebody like that might have been 
Yeah, maybe a Tony Delk efficient. or something yeah. like that. But I mean, that's uh, I mean, for him, I think he's, I think a lot of people try to consider him as kind of an overrated player, and I think he's pretty much underappreciated for what he brings to the table. Because now, is he going to have the size though to go to the next level? Well, I mean, he's six four. I think he's. I mean, he's thick. He's got. He's six four. He comes off a screen, ready to shoot. Yeah. The, the the stat statistics where they were showing the release from catch. Yeah. Did you it's see like some point of seven seconds? Uh, one, one time it was under a half a second, like point four seven uh, of one second yeah. before he caught the ball and released it for a three. Yeah, I mean that's just unbelievably fast. Yeah, you yeah. watch you watch Vandy, and I guarantee you it'll happen in this Wisconsin game on on Saturday. You know he comes off of that high screen right at the top of the top yeah. of the key. And if he's not if he's not shooting, everybody thinks he's shooting. He goes up, he gets fouled half the time. Yeah, yeah. And the boy can't miss a free throw. Yeah, How can. many times has he been fouled a, a past the three point arc? How oh my many, gosh. I'd like to see the statistics. How many have, times have they not called it? Well, there's you that know? too. Yeah. I mean, he had a couple just, times at the Kentucky game. Yeah, I mean, he. Um, but I, I think he puts the ball on the floor enough. The problem is, is does it translate to the NBA? And the NBA is just a total different game. And you know, he, you know, who would have thought that, you know, um, what was Vandy's all time leading 6'9 guy? Foster. From, not Foster, but the one before. Freegy? Freegy. Matt Freegy. I mean, if you saw Matt Freegy, he was 6'9 and he could just stroke it. And he never even sniffed the NBA, you know, and Foster never landed on any place. And it's just amazing the, the complete Grand Canyon difference between college basketball and NBA. Um, but well, we've talked about that before with the Jeremy Lin phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, how many players that, oh, yeah. because of their certain style or look, yeah. are never going to get the shot in the NBA that could probably be on the court every night. See, and I don't think he can handle the ball enough to be a point guard, and that's the problem. You have to have like a Steve Kerr type scenario, and there's not a lot of those guys out there. I mean, you got to be able to handle the ball enough. I mean, J.J. Redick, I mean, J.J. Redick is kind of the exception to the rule, and if you've seen him – I mean, he's starting in Orlando or coming off the bench. But, I mean, he is a completely different player than he was at Duke. And, exactly. Uh, he's thick. He's big. But he's tall. But he can put the ball on the floor. But he's a dead-eye shooter. I don't think Jenkins can do that. It's, it's going to be interesting. I think J.J. Reddick's a better player than he was. But that's just another thing. It's kind Go of off topic. But Yeah, it is off topic. But just to mention you know, something on that, J.J., you know, has always been in college, he was a spot-up shooter. I mean, I, he drove a little bit. But Jenkins is just like that. Jenkins, and people might kill me for saying this, but Jenkins has the hardest time creating his, his own, own shot. shot. Yeah. And one thing Reddick did is put, a, put some beef on his body, yeah. and he learned how to put the ball on the, on the floor and create his own shot. Now, he's not – your number one, hell, he's probably not yeah. the number five on that, you right. know, five on that team. But he's created, he's created a game that translates well, well in the NBA. And if Jenkins can do that, and if somebody can see that in him that he can do it and develop him, I think he'd be a good NBA player. Yeah, I mean, you would think that there would be a roster for him, um, you know. But the other thing is, is that you can also get. Uh, you know, you can also go over there to overseas and make a wonderful living for 15 years. All right, but if you're going overseas, the money that you're going to make over there, is it not worth just staying one more year in college? Possibly, but you can make some serious money over there. Yeah, you, I mean, you could be right. I mean, I don't see him going in the first round. He's not a lottery pick. No, I don't think either. So, to me, that you know, that's where you, you think he might be coming back uh, at, to Vanderbilt, but I, who knows? I, mean, I, I don't know. I, I, who was their big guy that, that left – and went to their Europe. Was it Ogilvy. Last year? Yeah. Ogilvy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he he had another year of eligibility. Yeah, but he needed to leave. I mean, he could go over to Australia, and he was born there and played on their national team, and he could go over there and play and make all the kind of money he wanted to make and be at home and not listen to all the Vandy fans cry. No, but – well, let's let's circle back around to the to Kentucky. We, we got a little off topic there, but the Kentucky Vandy game. Was it so much that Vanderbilt had good defense, or or Kentucky just had went cold? Because to me, if you look at it and you look back, Kentucky had some good looks at the basket. It wasn't that Vanderbilt was just playing this pressure defense that wasn't giving them a look. It was all of a sudden Kentucky went cold, and yeah. that, and and all you know me and being a Kentucky, I hadn't seen that yet all season. I'd never seen a slump like that. I mean, they couldn't hit anything the last five minutes of that ball game. Yeah, and and I think it's a little bit of. I thought that Vanderbilt was more aggressive than they had been. I thought they went really after them on the offensive end. 
um, you know, and, and it kind of caught Kentucky off guard because Kentucky wins their ball games on defense. I mean, that's what they're doing, and then they're just so efficient on the offensive end. And uh, I thought Davis took some questionable threes there in the last five minutes. Yes. They, they did have – some of those shots that I thought that they would normally make, you know, the the Darius Miller that's going to come in the last five minutes and hit two critical 15-footers um, that he creates off the dribble, he didn't do that. And, you know, Anthony Davis, you know, he takes a – I know a questionable three. Um, so, they didn't get some of the looks, you know, and, and I think Jones missed a couple of tip-ins around the basket. Um, but uh, Vanderbilt, I think, was more – Aggressive in that last five minutes and really wanted it more and uh, and I think it just I think Kentucky went on a slump and um, and, and then it kind of got to him a little bit. I, I, what do you think? Did you get to watch the last couple minutes? I didn't get to watch the last couple minutes, but uh, but I do agree with what uh, what Blair said. You know, usually in a game like that, the Mississippi State game, um, the LSU game, in the SEC tournament. Calipari looks at Terrence Jones and says, "Take over." Yeah. And um, and you know, I didn't hear didn't hear anybody say that's what happened. And it was I, I completely agree with what you're saying. They were missing some shots. The first thirty six uh, minutes, though, Terrence Jones was controlling that ball. Oh game. yes, oh yes. And yeah, when he's aggressive, yeah, they're and, a total different team. But you know, when they start missing some shots, they're young. I mean, people don't realize they are very young. And I mean, a bunch of freshmen, a bunch of sophomores, and they it gets to you. And Vanderbilt definitely was the aggressor in the ball game. Came after him, and it got to him. And uh, you you said it. I think you hit it. Vanderbilt wanted it more. Yeah. I think Kentucky was waiting for something to happen, and Vanderbilt sat there and made it happen. Well, and for UK, if you look at it, it's very difficult. No matter who you are, whether you're Kentucky or you, or the Miami Heat, yeah. to play a team three times in a row and win all yeah. three of those. Um, and, yeah, and, and, the and they had to do that back to back. I mean, they, they that was the yeah. third time they played Florida, yeah, and played them close every time. And then they had to turn around and play Vanderbilt, who did play yeah. three times already. And the the other thing is, um, you know, the thing that I thought was critical as well is sometimes when you have young players, um, especially on Vanderbilt side, so a lot of times when you have experienced players like a Tinsley in the game, he doesn't shoot that three that. The Johnson or the 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 what's the kid? The Taylor. Ta no, the uh, for freshman Kentucky? kid. No, the freshman kid for Vanderbilt, the point guard that came in, Kendra Johnson, right? Yes. Yeah. You know he shot that three with like a minute and forty five seconds left, and you're like, you got to be kidding me! And it bricks, and it goes off. They get a rebound, but you know he was the one that also made the drive on the wing and made the reverse layup and got fouled, and so he was a guy that kind of brought some energy that I don't think you get with Tinsley on the floor. But he was young enough to not realize he, th there weren't any reins holding him in, if that makes any sense. And I think that really helped Vanderbilt at the end because I think I think he forced a lot of, you know, I think he forced a lot of things and it ended up working out for him. But I think it kind of got everybody else kind of aggressively because I think a lot of times they get very passive in those situations and they kind of get a little bit frozen. And I thought he was a nice change of pace because he forced the issue a little bit. Well, let's look now to the week that we're we're in right now. I mean, we've got the – we'll go over it real quick. And we've kind of alluded to most of this stuff. So we're going to just kind of cover it a, a little bit more um, in in the area we're supposed to. But, you know, we had eight teams go to the turn of, in, to tournament action for the NIT, for uh, – to the NCAA tournament. And, and really the SEC is not bode well – in the NIT world, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I think I, I think both Mississippi boys can definitely yeah, say can, no. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, Mississippi State had a tough loss. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you, you couple that with the Georgia loss, and you know, not getting into the bid, and you know, everybody was saying, hey, you know, are you going to show up for a game at home? You know, two days later. I mean, it was literally like Tuesday night, if I'm not mistaken. So. Yeah, it was I mean, a, very yeah, short, the night yeah. of the first four in. So. Yeah, so, you know, that was the deal. Were they going to come with energy? And then, of course, they had a low crowd at 2,500 that showed up for the game. So the fans kind of spoke about their disappointment, I think. And it was spring break, so obviously none of the students were there. But they don't have a large student, you know, section anyway with regards to those games. So um, I think the fans spoke from that standpoint. But, uh, 
you know, Sydney played, uh, you know, the girly game that he plays all the time where he, you know, has his shirt untucked and doesn't play the last 28 minutes. And Wendell Lewis plays in his place, fouls out with seven minutes to go, and they play four guards for the first time all year and uh, and sit Sydney on the bench. So it was one of those deals where they didn't have any energy. They, they tried to make a game of it, went to double overtime, but, you know, ended up uh, losing that. And, um, you know, it was just one of those kind of a – triumph the disaster of an end to a basketball season that I've actually seen in a while. And their early exit actually cost them, I mean, a, oh, yeah. se- a four seed in the NIT, yeah. which is not where you expected Mississippi State to be. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, they win at Georgia. Um, I think they win the Georgia game. They actually are in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I do too. Um, I think I, we because because Lenardi and yeah. uh, Palm yeah. all wanted Mississippi State there. Yeah. I mean, up mm-hmm. until – Saturday afternoon, if you looked, you had five teams from the SEC yeah. going into the tournament. So they were trying to give Mississippi State every benefit of the doubt to, to try to get in there. Yeah, and, um, you know, it's one of those things. And, you know, it was kind of ironic because, you know, Tennessee didn't really need an Ole Miss to win. Um, you know, and then they were really playing for possibly an NCAA berth, both of them, you know, because if Ole Miss wins – Against Vanderbilt, and makes it to the championship game. You got to look at their resume, and they would have been, they would have went in. Yeah, they would, they would have gone in, and then of course Tennessee beats Ole Miss, gets a shot at Vanderbilt. You know, which they've just beaten. You know, a week earlier. So, um, you know, some of the scenarios that just kind of played out. All of a sudden, you know, what are we sitting there with four teams? And you know, Alabama really was kind of a a, a late guy into the to the dance, so to speak. So it was uh, was pretty frustrating, I think, from an SEC standpoint because it was truly top-heavy and it was very disappointing as it kind of started in SEC play. You thought it might play out a little bit different, but, yeah, it was pretty disappointing from that standpoint. Yeah, with about three weeks to go, we started talking about teams that were, you know, on the bubble or could make it or have a chance. And and Alabama was a team that had to play their way in. And I think we said Mississippi State had to play Play their their way way out. Yeah. And uh, and they they definitely did that and played themselves right out of a coach. Yep. And we'll we'll talk about that as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, today uh, one o'clock, uh, Rick Stansberry re- re- retires uh, is what they're calling it. But uh, um, from Mississippi State. Yeah. And so, I I mean, it's been kind of funny on Twitter all day about the comments of you know is you know retirement, ha ha ha. But um, I think Stansberry just kind of Trump the inevitable you know beforehand I, I really think that he went and um because i think he wants to stay in starville i think he wants to take a deep breath and you know he's a big family guy and so uh he'd been there 22 years including his assistant um stint of eight years under williams so he's been there a long time and uh so i think for mississippi state fans for me personally i was ready for a change but I also wanted to understand that if you you got to take consideration of what he did in 14 years. I mean, he won 200, I think 93 games, and uh, completely owned the Ole Miss in that that 14 year no, period. I completely agree. I completely agree. <laughs> Other than a couple of years right there, but it most most years it's split. But the last couple of years, I know that uh, Ole Miss was uh, very very happy to get yeah. that win in Oxford this year. I think it was the first. Uh, First win we've had in the two major sports in uh, men's uh, men's basketball and football in the last three or four years. years. So yeah. it was great. And, uh, you know, but Stansbury, I will say this as an Ole Miss fan, Stansbury, uh, you know, he might not be the best bench coach, yeah. but he could get some talent into that town. And uh, Mississippi State teams were always, uh, were always competitive and uh, always played the very, very good teams very well. Yeah. And unfortunately uh, didn't show up sometimes on the uh, – on the lesser yeah. teams in the SEC, but um, you, to me, so they're they're a lot like Tennessee because to me Tennessee, especially during the Bruce Pearl uh, time, they always played to their competition. Yeah. If they had a bad team, they were playing bad. If they had a great team, they came to play. Yeah. And and Mississippi State was a little bit like that. Yeah. Stansberry, you know, the thing about him was um, the, the thing that was frustrating the last two years and really the last three years is the one thing we've talked about this on the podcast. The one thing you could always guarantee was they were going to D you up and they were going to rebound. In the last three years, they were completely undisciplined. Um, I mean, if you watch the UMass NIT game the other night, I mean, they don't have a guard that can get over the top of a screen to save their life. I mean, D-Bost, I love him. He spent four years. 
but he gives absolutely no effort to get over a pick. And they didn't demand it. And and, and the problem was, unfortunately, it, I think it stems to one guy, and that's Renardo Sidney. Um, and I think that created this, you know, undisciplined aura around this team the last two years that you really could never shake. And I think Stansberry could never grasp it. And, um, and I think he saw the writing on the wall, and he wanted to kind of go out. And I think – Today was, for a Mississippi State fan, it was a good way to end it because it could have got ugly um, because I think if we were going down a road where it wasn't going to end good. And I think Stansberry kind of took the high road, and it was a day to actually kind of celebrate, hey, this is what – you know, you got to remember what he did his first 12 years and not really what he did the last two years. Um, and he said it. He said the last three years have been as disappointing as can be, and the only, play, only person that you can blame that on is a coach. And uh, so, I mean, he kind of stepped up and owned it today, but there were people there that got to kind of celebrate it and uh, and you can kind of move on. And so I'm interested to see where we go from here because, you know, I, I got Ole Miss friends that, you know, three weeks ago, Andy Kennedy, they're ready for a move, and all of a sudden he's made it difficult for him to make a move. Very difficult. You know, it was difficult last year to make that move because of his contract situation. So now – you know, and, and I, I kind of equate what the last couple of years with Stansbury is with what's kind of going on with Ole Miss because he's been – this is his sixth year. He hasn't made an NCAA tournament. And he's still in this NIT, and you're just like, are, is there anything better? And you this know? year it's one and done for Ole Miss yeah. in the NIT. That's yeah. correct. That's correct. And, you know, with the, uh, with the Ole Miss loss last night to Illinois State, you know, once again this season we hit a team that could not miss. Yeah. I think that happened oh, to us yeah. at least three or four times this year. Vanderbilt, obviously the better team when we played them, but, you know, Jeffrey Taylor could not miss a <laughs> shot. He was on fire, absolutely embarrassed us on national television. Uh, and then last night, um, forgive me, I don't know, the, uh, don't know the player's name, but, you know, as a team, Illinois State shot. Just blame Comcast. There you go. <laughs> Comcast is, uh, is at fault for that, but uh, – I believe Illinois State shot 76% from beyond the three-point line. And if I'm not mistaken, they shot more than half of their field goal attempts were from beyond the three-point line. Yeah. Um, I had a friend that was at the game. He said that uh, we played about as good as we could play. We yeah. just could not, we could not match their shooting. And uh, we kept making runs. We kept getting close, and they'd go on a little run. We, got a, we were able to put it in overtime. And uh, – you know, their hot shooting just continued and weren't able to uh, pull it out. But there, uh, There's hardly any team that can beat. I mean, a 1 versus 16 in the NCAA tournament can't beat somebody if they were shooting 76%. No. 17 threes made out of 23 attempts. You said that was the most in the tad pad. By that's the most, the most that any team has ever uh, – that's the most three-pointers given up in the history of Ole Miss. What was the final score, do you know? I don't uh, know. I think ninety six to ninety three, I yeah. think, or something like that. So, but I mean, fifty one. We had a shot at the we, points. Yeah, we had a shot at the end to tie. It. I mean, that's what Andy Kennedy's press conference. I saw his statement where he was like, I mean, he looked at the stat sheet and he was like, seventeen threes. He goes, "How did we even get it to o overtime?" You know, I mean, when you think about that, and he's like, "You got to give it to them. They made they made some incredible shots, and you know, but good man. I mean, seventeen out of twenty three, even if you're open." Now, That's how was impressive. the defense against Ole Miss? Were they defended the, no, well? No, the defense. The defense, from what I've heard and what I saw, it wasn't the. It wasn't like Ole Miss played against Vanderbilt. When when Ole Miss played against Vanderbilt, Jenkins and Taylor and everybody else was wide open when they were yeah, shooting. Yeah. From what I've heard and what I saw, Ole Miss had a hand in the face. The guys just could not miss. Okay, and that's not an. You, know, that's you not can't an do anything against. You that. can't do anything. Against I mean, that. When they had two guys. One guy went eight for nine from the three point line. And the other guy went six for six. <laughs> I mean, that's just. That's ridiculous, man. It is. I mean, it's it? 14 of your uh, – You know, and it's, and it's very, very disappointing as an Ole Miss fan, you know, for us to be out. Obviously, you know, I, you were mentioning earlier three weeks ago what, what teams you were talking about being on the bubble. Hell, five weeks ago I wasn't even thinking Ole Miss was, had a shot at the NCAA. Right. And they show up in the SEC tournament, which was great. And like I mentioned earlier, three-fourths of, you know, three of the way through the Vanda game, we're in it. You know, we're, we're down by two or three. We're playing well. And then, uh, then Jenkins takes over, and um, you know the better team won that game, and we get in the NIT, we get a two seed, which you know you can debate if we deserved it or not, but um, but you know you you meet up with a team that can't miss like that, and uh, it's hard. But yeah. but you know Kennedy, you mentioned this earlier. Kennedy, uh, 
you know, he definitely was on the hot, uh, you know, hot seat last yeah. year, and and even midway through this year he was. But um, you know, but I think a lot of a lot of people at Ole Miss do like him, do yeah. like what he's doing. Um, you know, the the Kendrick the Kendrick saga yeah. at Ole Miss this year was a huge disappointment. It's not, you know, it almost it's almost as bad as the Renardo Sydney right. at Mississippi State. You know, Kendrick is definitely, uh, you know, it's, I, it's also ironic that when yeah. he took a stand, he actually turned around the season and, exactly and started playing good ball. Um, for for people that are listening, Jalen is it Jalen Kendrick? Jalen Kendrick. He was the McDonald's All American that was kicked out of Memphis before he even got to play at Memphis. He transferred. <laughs> Um, because yeah, he couldn't, and, yeah. because he couldn't uh, get along with his teammates. Yeah, and Passner, if you watch Passner, and that I mean, was after Coach Cal too. That's yeah. correct. And that was, and that was Passner. You know, and the problem with you know, if you watch Memphis this year, you know, Passner, you know, he had his battle with that one guy, and he finally, he finally put his, you know, foot in the sand. You know, come end of December, and so you've seen what Memphis has done the rest of the way. So, um, it just goes to show. How you got to be able to you got to be able to create a discipline. I like Kennedy as well. I mean, he's a Mississippi guy. Um, he he's perfect for Ole Miss, and I do think he's got some talent that's coming in. Um, and I think with what's happening at Mississippi State, he can he can take advantage in state uh, on some kids that um, that that might be able to. Uh, to help, definitely help him, but at some point in time, he's got to get to that tournament. And, oh, I completely and agree. It's, it's a frustrating thing, but uh, how, that brings up a question that I have: How quick do you think Mississippi State is going to move now to get a new coach? Well, according to Strickland, it's not. There's no timetable. It he depends on how far Vandy goes in the tournament. <laughs> no, he uh, he's well, that, that's, uh, South, that's Carolina. South Carolina. Excuse but uh, I, you know, to be honest with you, I have no idea. Um, you know, he he said today that he's not he doesn't um, he's not disqualifying anybody so they could be young old they could be a small school big school they could be an assistant or they can be a head coach so um, the one thing that I feel confident about is if you actually seen with Greg Byrne which Scott Strickland was under um, and, and basically worked with I mean he's the one that brought in Mullen he's the one that brought in John Cohen he's the one that just brought in our new basketball girls basketball coach who's uh, a lifelong um, basically the creator of defense and women's basketball from Texas A&M, and he's like this defensive guru. So he's taking his first head coaching job, and he's like 50. Um, but um, they pried him away from Texas A&M. And, um, and the Olympic sports that we've actually hired, he's made some great hires. So I've, I got all the confidence in the world Scott Strickland will be able to to roll in. And it also helps that you got a brand-new $12 million basketball facility to – show everybody and and that's a big deal i think uh as well so you know state's got some history there i think they can get somebody i'd like some young guy you know a little bit of energy kind of following that that young energetic well, mold strickland's a young guy himself yeah. too yeah, yeah i mean he's under yes. 40. so i mean and I, I alluded to this uh, just a second ago with with south carolina but they're the other team you know if you're yep. talking about coaching changes in the sec there's been two already uh, and we're, you know, SEC champion, SEC tournaments, four days old, and it's two, two are gone. And I think that's really going to be your only casualties. Yeah. Um, you know, unless Calipari goes to the Knicks, but you know, that's just kind of one of those things. <laughs> but um, now the uh, the uh, South Carolina, I mean, Darren Horn, we talked right, about that. Let me ask this: Are there any rumors out there for Kentucky violations? Because you know, that's that's his yeah. mo, right? There's that, always rumors about Kentucky violations. They keep them quiet. Whatever. They keep them quiet till the tournament's over. Whatever, um, but Darren Horn is gone. He's gone to South Carolina, and um, you know I've got. And he doesn't have a vacancy at Western any longer. No, man, that guy guy took it over, didn't he? He did. Took the interim tag off, and you win six games. So and get to the NCAA tournament is the only team with a a losing record. So, but uh, no, I, I I'd be interested to see what South Carolina does, uh, brother-in-law. Like I was telling y'all earlier. Um, is a uh, South Carolina guy. He's been on the podcast before, Mark. And uh, the, the interesting thing was obviously Greg Marshall shows up as a candidate automatically. He was in that running with Darren Horton before. I believe he was actually at um, Wofford, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that. And who that. does Wichita State have um, this week? Are they got a pretty tough matchup yeah. this first round. It's a, Wichita, Wichita State is playing. Uh, actually, they're playing right, right, right now. Right now. But they were in a pretty close game with um, 
And we could tell you yeah. about pulling we up could, the internet. Comcast, Comcast, there yeah. you go. Yeah. But, uh, but he, is, you know, he was the one that always pops up for the UT job because he had UT connections. But, um, it's, but he's the guy that I think will be kind of a leading candidate. But now but wasn't he somewhat in the discussion when Darren Horn was yes, hired as well, was. though? I mean, it wasn't like that's an unknown name in South yeah. Carolina. Right. Oh, and we've so got internet for a second. New, Mex- New Mexico. That's who Wichita State's playing. That's right. It was a close game at halftime. I'm not sure what the score is now. but No, yeah. New Mexico State has New Mexico. Indiana. Oh, okay. New Mexico. Number five seed. Wichita State's a uh, 12. 12. I so believe. I'd be interested be to see who South Carolina gets. I mean, if you follow South Carolina at all, I mean, they've got an unbelievable basketball facility. Um, sits right at 20,000. Um, brand new facility. I mean, it's under – three years old um you know you got eddie fogler right there all the time you know he's living there in columbia he likes it new mexico has long beach state long beach okay wrong well i'll tell you one thing about the sec schools one thing i've liked to see in the last oh, couple of years vcu oh mm. shaka shaka Shaka's another smart. name another name that ends up in sec talk a lot man that'd be nice when you get shaka down the state well, one of those two coaches are going to be available after he, about another hour or he's, so. He's too high profile. But you think about that. Like, well, does he leave? He has his, uh, you know, he could have had his swan song in the Final Four last year with VCU and gone to a bigger program. But he stays on with them, with the kids. So does he leave to go somewhere like South Carolina or Mississippi State? But, you know, the SEC, what I was about to say, the SEC is uh, – they have put some big money into men's basketball the last couple of years. You talk about Mississippi State with the new indoor practice facility, Ole Miss with the new indoor practice facility. Ole Miss is in the uh, currently raising money to build a new arena, finally yeah. going to have some games that you can actually see on Auburn. television. Auburn just built Auburn, that. Auburn, gorgeous, facility. gorgeous arena. It didn't help their basketball program. No, know. no, well, you know, point shaving will do that to you. So <laughs> <laughs> I totally forgot about that. We have not talked about that. Oh, man. You want to talk about that for a minute? I, you know, I don't really know a whole bunch about it, but, I mean, you know, it, it goes to show uh, it goes to show something when you have a point shaving at Auburn, and one of the games that's brought up is uh, he was shaving points against Alabama. Oh. So, you know, if he's found guilty, which, uh, you know, even if he's not, his name's associated with him now, I don't know if that boy can uh, stay in that state for too long. So... Maybe you can call Feinbaum and say he uh, he poisoned the trees. <laughs> uh, but uh, where, were, where were we talking before we went off stock? Coaching oh, yeah, changes. Yeah, we were just talking coaching changes. But uh, I think we pretty much covered that. I, the One of the rumors is Kevin Stallings' name is a, is a point of interest for the South Carolina job, which everybody will laugh at. But I've, Now, that I've would get told. him closer to his son, who plays currently for North, North Carolina, Carolina in That's baseball. Right. So, I mean, if you were, you're thinking about that, that would – there's some logistic purposes there I, I where think, it makes sense. I think where that's driven from is that he's basically going to have a decimated roster after this year. I mean, there's no way they're an NCAA tournament next year with the talent with the talent that they're leaving. I mean, they're losing uh, they're losing everybody, and if they lose Jenkins, they're losing uh, all five and then starters. Losing, yeah, then they're losing Chin, Chin Gang and uh, you know. The who else? I mean, they they got I think five or six seniors, and then Jenkins. So um, they're going to be they're going to be hurting pretty good for for sure. So that may be you know in in his period of time there, you know, it is one of those things where you kind of get a fresh start and kind of get a new place, but uh, be kind of interesting. It'd be back to back can get you know. Little Eddie Fogler from Vanderbilt to South Carolina. I think Little that's division kind of fun. Yeah. division rivals. Yeah, that's so. pretty funny. Well, the only two teams in the NIT we've not talked about is LSU. They got destroyed by, by Oregon. Oregon. By Oregon, what'd you say? About twenty. About twenty points. <clears throat> played not, in that. Uh, played on that uh, ugly court up in Eugene. The uh, one that looks like a tree. And uh, you know LSU. You know LSU is very young, very very young, but. Uh, Played Kentucky well. I think that was probably the highlight of their season if it wasn't for beating Ole Miss in the first SEC game. But, uh, well, they beat State, right? Yeah. And they beat State, too. So, But, uh, you know, they were probably lucky to get to the NIT anyway and they had to get put out of their misery by Oregon. And then Tennessee. 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 Uh, the only SEC team left in the NIT. Number one seed in the SEC tournament. I mean, the NIT tournament, I believe. And. You know, took care of business and um, have a home a home state rivalry again. Yeah, right? MTSU. So uh, and MTSU was, uh, I believe, they were pretty disappointed not to, not oh, to be man. in consideration. Just horrible. 
Hopkins. 25 and 5 get, regular season. The, yeah, and, and the, the quarterfinals. Belt, and the Sun Belt wasn't strong, so they got put out in the quarterfinals of the tournament, so they were definitely not one got, of those. Got put out by the nine seed, so, Arkansas State. You know who that was? Um, A little SEC connection. John Brady. Really? Guess who the assistant coach is? Tell me. Richard Williams. Richard Williams. Took Mississippi State to the Final Four. Yeah. And so John Brady was his assistant at Mississippi State. Wow. He is now his assistant at Arkansas State. Ties have changed. <laughs> <laughs> but so that's the only team left. I, I, I realistically think that they're going to get past MTSU. Oh, I definitely think so, yeah. I don't know, man. They're, MTSU's good, but. Man, that Denny kid is the real deal. And uh, I think from a matchup standpoint, we also got hopefully Maimon's going to be healthy because he didn't play against Savannah State. Okay. Uh, so they played. Janelle, Janelle, Janelle Stroke Stokes or whatever. Janelle Stokes and Jarnell Stokes. Jarnell. Jarnell. Stokes. Jarnell. That's Jarnell. It. I and believe. I, you, know, you can tell there's not a lot of UT people yeah. here. We're, we're trying to can yes, pronounce. Names. Yeah, it's Jarnell. But I will say, MTSU, uh, MTSU will have a uh, chip on their shoulder playing because uh, they don't get they don't get that many shots at UT. Yeah. UT, uh, UT doesn't typically. They played Bandy well. Yeah, um, the did. one shot they had this year. So mm. it's. I, uh, but the way Tennessee has finished this season, I mean, they're a much better team in mid-February to March than they were January or November, December, and even into January. I mean, they are definitely coming into their own. Um, they've got some talent on the program. Conzo Martin has that team believing and starting to play that he wants them to play. It's a different program than the way Bruce Pearl played basketball. And it, I think it took some time for everybody to adjust to that and get used to that program. But I think they're finally buying into it, and you're starting to see those rewards. I've said all along when I was, you know, back in December and early January as I was watching them play, and they kept losing a close game and losing another close game. It's This is a team that, as a Kentucky fan, I don't want to see in mid-February. I'm yeah. so glad that – the schedule works out that we play them early at Thompson Bowling in January, and we, we fit, we're we playing them in January again at Rupp Arena. Yeah. Uh, because it's not a team I wanted to see in February, and Vanderbilt fell you know victim to that. And the other thing is, is Kanza Martin did a really good job from a discipline standpoint this year where he was able to take a line. You know, he sat um, Golden down the one game because of a, an effort level, and and then, then he took the stance on Hall, um, whereas – you know, it it basically set the standard that you know you're gonna you're gonna do things the way I want to do it, and this is my chance. And what he did is he actually did that and still made um, made the ability to actually improve as a team. So you got to like that from a coaching standpoint. But uh, um, you know, it's I don't know what UT fans are. You know, I don't know what they're even paying attention with all this uh, this uh, this savior possibly coming back to Tennessee, and all I'm having to convert from Colt fans to Titans fans. So, well, I was listening to that's that's a, a good point. Um, I was listening to the radio today, and up in certain parts of East Tennessee, they still show Colts games on Sunday instead of a Titans game. Yeah, they said that they've actually changed that because they, I guess the Titans won't allow that anymore or something. But yeah, like when they first did it, they. They would show Indianapolis games over the Titans games, which is – And so that hilarious. just shows how fanatic the, the state of Tennessee is and UT fans are for Peyton Manning. Oh, yeah. And, I, and you know, it, we're talking NFL, but that that's such an SEC connection that I think it, it definitely serves talk about conversation it. in the in a, the sports roundtable of ours. I yeah. Mean, talk about a guy that gets it, Peyton Manning. You know, he's the guy that, you know – he calls all the media members by their first name, you know, all that. He's Mr. Savvy. Shows up in the Titans facility with his nice, strong orange pullover. You know, I'm like, yeah. He just knows how to stir the pot, man. It's just fantastic. And the local radio stations were playing Rocky Top. Yeah. You know, it's just, they love it. They love it. It's unbelievable. They it's awesome. It. I'm fired up too. Uh, I'm, you, know? you know, my my dislike for the state for Tennessee, but yeah. uh, it's great for the Titans. Oh, it yeah, sure man. is. If if they can if they can pull this, I, I would consider it a coup. Yeah. Because I mean, if you look at the the, the Twitter and Chris Mortensen and oh, yeah. all the folks at ESPN, Andy Katz, uh, who else? Who's a bald guy losing? Mo John Clayton. Yeah, John Clayton. I mean, all of them. You know, it was Peyton Manning. To Denver. Yeah, John yeah. Elway's be new best friend, you know, that courtship. He knows quarterbacks. He, he can relate to them. 
Um, so he's he's a Denver Bronco. It's almost, I mean almost right. signed, sealed, and delivered. And out of nowhere, you know, the local media here in, in Nashville had been talking about this, yeah. but it did not get. I mean, it took up until late Tuesday, yeah. early Wednesday, before you got any national press that there was a possibility that Peyton Manning could come to talk to the Titans. And and now it's it's seemingly like it might happen. I mean, by the time this podcast gets. Okay. Uh, produced and out, it might be might yeah. be fact. It's fantastic because you know Bud Adams, he's 89 years old and he's a billionaire for a reason. And him, you know, he he knew that he had to kind of take things in his own hand and stir the pot. So he comes out and you know I, I think that this week this morning they he, he tells Titan, Houston Titan for life. Yeah, yeah he's I mean, got a, a lifetime contract. He's and it, that's just funny. I was like I was sitting there going. I wonder what that. Wonder what the salary cap implications are for a contract <laughs> for life. <laughs> I mean, how do they do that? You know, know, it's one of those things. But it's just, I think it's a great thing for Nashville. We're here in Nashville, of course. But uh, I think it'd be fantastic. And if you have tickets, my goodness, you could sell them for mint. Yeah, for what, out loud. what it greatly it does so. is it creates a, a much larger fan base. Oh because, yes, because how many, how many businesses are fixing to make a phone call to the stadium to get their how many, logo on? I was about to say, how many have already called for suite tickets or season tickets that that might try to you know upgrade their season ticket package yeah. just for the the possibility that this is going to occur? Because after the fact. It's too late. Yeah, yeah. Pre- preseason tickets are a bit, you know, will be hard to come by if Peyton comes there. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. The casual fan base that, uh, you know, all all NFL teams have their passionate fan base, but the casual fans, especially like you mentioned, yeah. the ones up in East Tennessee, all of them that have been following the Colts will jump on the Titans bandwagon. Oh, yeah. It's going to be so exciting. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine? Because he's not wearing 18. So, you know, if he comes to the Titans, he's put on that 16. Yeah, how many of those? I mean, can you imagine how much the orange, jersey? How much sales? orange would end up showing up? I mean, it's going to be insane. The dude. Titans orange alternate jersey. Oh my god! I saw a great. I, I can I see saw it now, great, and I don't like it. I saw a great tweet last night, and you might have actually seen it from John McClain, who covers down in Houston, who obviously has covered Bud forever. And he said Bud is eighty nine, and he said Tennessee gave Texas Davy Crockett. Bud's trying to give Tennessee Peyton Manning. I thought it was one of the funniest tweets. I've ever <laughs> but I mean, the implications that it makes to to Tennessee and its fan base is just—I mean, it's exponential. And I'm not saying that Tennessee has a bad fan base. We're a small market program. We've sold out since we've been here. Yeah. I mean, there, every game has been a sellout. But if you go to the games, there's still fifteen, eighteen thousand seats sometimes that are vacant. Yeah. Um, that they're bought, especially this last two years, bought and paid for, but just they didn't yeah. go to. Um, so you're not going to get a huge influx in ticket sales because they're sold out already. Yeah. So that's not going to make an impact. So what else can you do as a Titans organization to increase your fan base? Now I know Bud Adams. He, I, I don't know if he thought of that. When he was thinking, what can I do to get a Super Bowl before I die in the next six months? Uh, but I mean, because his, his time's t- is, it's gonna be is hard short. to do that and get a Super Bowl in six months. Yeah, though. you never know. <laughs> he, he might try to with Peyton Manning. They might speed up the schedule a little bit. But what it really does is, is think of all the extra um, jersey sales. Oh yeah. The the fan base we've already talked about the the viewership and what will happen is if he retires as a Titan those those casual fans that we talk about that were Colts fans or Peyton yeah. Manning fans will become Titans fans oh yeah and so you're creating a whole just n- think of the Titans brand I mean the Tennessee Titans will be known in Tokyo Japan because Peyton Manning signed with the Titans. I mean that's how big it is like he'll it's be on registered. Gatorade commercials yeah. now and and the other thing you're going to be looking at is you're going to be Monday night football, Sunday night yeah, football, so Thursday night that was flex next, games. Yeah. The schedule I mean, hasn't been set. So yeah. how many <laughs> primetime games are we going to get and more national exposure? It's going to be I mean, just, him going back to Indianapolis. It just it's increased a by – It's a national televised It just game. increased two Monday night games. Oh, yeah. yeah At least. Because we might not have had one. And, and if you've seen well, our think, schedule and the quarterbacks that we're playing this year, we've got an unbelievable schedule. I mean, Tom Brady – Coming to town, I believe. Monday night football. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, the list, I think it's like six or seven, like, elite. I mean, Aaron Rodgers, the whole deal that are coming. I mean, it's just going to be, 
Yeah. We're talking like it's happening. If it doesn't happen, they might as well just flood the stadium again. There's In about be, three weeks, everybody's going to be jumping off bridges and there, stuff. Shelby Street Bridge will be very yeah. – there's going to be a patrol boat yeah. going underneath the Cumberland. Um, and, and it might not, but, I mean, it, it sounds like yeah. from listening to talk radio that all indications are that that's pretty much a done deal. And one of the only things that's holding it up right now is a wedding. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, of all things, the the press conference is supposed to be scheduled for Monday if it happens. Yeah. Because of Bud Adams' grandson getting married in Asheville this this weekend, so that's something else. Now, if this happens, obviously the news won't last until Monday. Right. But, no, uh, it'll leak out. But now, th- there was a recent signing, and, and I don't want to get too far into the NFL because that's not our our sweet spot. We can talk it all day, but that's not what we do here. But we. The Titans Hutchinson. just signed Hutchinson, Hutchinson, and the same Hughes. agent, same agent as Peyton, and yeah. a- and Manning and Hutchinson are real close, from yeah. what I understand too. So I mean, you don't want to read tea leaves and see see stuff that's not there, but that's what we do with podcast radio oh, yeah. and talk radio is is make those inferences. But it, well, it, the other thing is, is, I think I think from a national media standpoint, I mean, obviously Nashville's small market, we know that, but I think they. I think they truly underestimate a Bruce Matthews and a Mike Munchak having a conversation with a Peyton Manning because Peyton Manning's, you know, historical view of football and his history that he understands that you've got two Hall of Fame guys that you know, and Mike Munchak is a guy that's a Peyton Manning type of guy. Yeah. You know, he's like, you know, be a pro, act like a pro, you know, his little slogan or whatever. Yeah, it would be a great be locker room. Be a pro and do your job. It'd be a great locker room next year. Yeah, I think I mean you talk about the Titans have had had issues in the past, you know, three or four seasons of having leadership in the locker yeah. room. And last year it took up some big steps to get rid of that. This year it's gone yeah. if that happens. I think uh I think it's I think it's interesting and and I know we're all from NFL football but I think it's such a unique time because you know this is a time where you have basically like twice as many free agents as you've ever had in the market. So a lot of teams and I think you'll see this over the next 3 weeks where you know Titans are going to release some guys. I mean, they signed another offensive lineman there's some more they're fixing to cut. Yeah. And that's happening across the board. And I think teams are – they're they're being able to shop like they've never been able to shop, and they won't be able to do that for another 10 years, according to the CBA deal, because this is kind of like the one anomaly that, that's happening here. It's, it's getting everything back to the way right. it needs to be exactly. from, from the previous – Because last year they had the – you know, last year they had – basically how many one-year veteran contracts, you know, and everything's – so it's going to be pretty cool. Fun stuff. And it's going to be a lot of dominoes that fall. I mean, Peyton Manning is going to control where a lot of individuals end up when he decides to sign. Well, I think he's already almost uh, caused one. I mean, I believe everybody – a lot of people in Nashville thought that Mario Mario Williams would – was number one on our radar to get. And because Peyton came available and – because he his interest he showed in the Titans, Mario takes a trip with his fiance to Buffalo. Buffalo pays him a astronomical sum to uh, to sign there. So you know we don't have a shot. We don't have a shot at him. Not that you know I would rather have Peyton Manning than Mario yeah. Williams. Yeah. But and you're already seeing quarterbacks shuffling and understanding. Matt Matt Flynn. Yeah. Matt Ryan. Sorry. Uh, Matt Flynn. Matt no, Flynn. Matt Flynn. Uh, you know, he's already scheduled appointments at Seattle and now Miami, the yeah. two people that, you know, were trying to get the get in on the main yeah. sweepstakes. So, mm-hmm. well, we have gotten way off base with our with our pro football talk, so we might end up having to do a pro football <laughs> podcast, unlike the, the million others that we have out there. Um, <clears throat> anything else on the NCAA tournament before we go open, Mike? Well, I just want to ask uh, – I just want to ask you all two, who do you all have winning it? Shane, I think that's pretty, uh, pretty silly, but uh, – who do you ha- who do you have in your final four? Or who do you have it winning at all? I have Western Kentucky upsetting Kentucky in the first round. You know, Sarah was going to ask me what you were going to do about that. <laughs> I mean, I heard the guys calling in. They're like, "I'm sick of these Western Kentucky young alumni that are talking trash because Kentucky's going to beat them because they grew up a Kentucky fan, but they're a graduate of Western." And I'm like, you know, I don't know. Anyway, I, I, I'm very happy that Western Kentucky made the tournament. Yeah, but. Let's face it; They're it's a di- it's a different caliber program. What's the score, by the way? Western Kentucky has the sixth youngest team in the entire NCAA. Yeah. They have a coach that wasn't the coach in January first. I mean, they have so much to build upon on this season. This season is a success in everybody's book, but there's no way they're getting past Kentucky. Yeah. And realistically, the 
there's no such thing as a good loss, but it's a good learning experience for yeah. Kentucky um, because they showed, you know, Cal is, is for – Everything that he gets blamed upon, he's an excellent coach. Uh, he knows how to game plan a, a, a game. He knows how to get the most out of his players. And if he's not going to do anything, he's going to show that this was the example of what can happen. Yeah. And from a Kentucky standpoint, that's not going to happen the rest of the way. Um, so I'm going to see a UK Duke rematch on the 20th anniversary, and we're not going to let them get close this time. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> And then we're going to see. I've got Kentucky playing North Carolina in the finals with Kentucky. Right? Where's the Where's that? Uh, the UK play? The UK uh, Duke game could happen in the South Regional Final, which would be Atlanta. I so really? I will be there next weekend, hoping for a. Uh, I definitely hope for the uh, UK Duke. That'd be Duke awesome. Game. That would be great. But also, I think uh, you know. We'll see how the tournament plays out, but um, but I actually have Baylor playing Kentucky in that game in my bracket, and uh, I think that'd be a great game. With the athletes be. on the field, on the uh, on the court, it would be unbelievable. Yeah. I can tell you that I haven't even looked at a bracket, and I'm excited that I haven't. I mean, literally got home on Tuesday, and I really haven't even cared much about it, and I decided I wasn't even going to look at the brackets. I was just going to go watch basketball. So, what a great time of the year, though! Oh, great man. time. The problem was is going out of town the week before because I'm trying to catch up on all my work, and it's killing me tomorrow. And I really don't even have Kentucky playing Duke in my bracket. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I'd like to see in my heart, but my mind tells me Duke's not going to make it. They're, they're getting beat by Xavier. Oh. So, but let's, let's wrap this thing up. Um, we're going to – the way we do this when we close out shop, I don't know how much you've listened to this all the way through our podcast, but we have an open mic. So it can be sports related. It can be non-sports related, whatever you want to talk about uh, for for however long you want to take the mic. And we'll let Blair start us off and tell us where, where they can find you if they want to follow you on Twitter or anything like that, Cole. Well, I'm on Twitter at, at Blair Smiley, uh, S-M-Y-L-Y. Don't look for me to tweet out. I'm more of a follower. Um, but... Uh, not the the had a fantastic trip uh to Clearwater with the family this week and uh so uh kind of got a nice little break so I appreciated that and a little um a little um nice little thing that I found um this past week is a website Todd's Take which is Todd Furman who is a sports book at uh, Caesar's Palace um he comes on one of the local sports talk shows here the 3HL I'll give them a shout out but he comes on and gives all the odds and stuff about betting or whatever and uh, with my brother-in-law going to Vegas he wasn't keeping up with basketball because South Carolina is terrible and uh, so he wanted some takes so I actually found his website I follow him on Twitter and so if you have a chance follow at Todd Furman and it's I think it's F-U-R-F-U-H-R-M-A-N if I believe that's how it is but he's got a website called Todd's Take and if you're kind of a odds guy he he kind of shows how the books and um everything do things they actually did their own sports book bracket of how they would have ranked the teams and seated them uh compared to what the committee did and it was pretty amazing locally here they had belmont as the 16th rated team and would have had them as a four seed and they are a 14 seed playing georgetown so it's kind of interesting they were the most undervalued team and i have them beating georgetown in my bracket it's gonna be tough it is but i, I mean if Georgia, you look georgia georgetown starts like four guys, six, eight, or taller. But if they're undisciplined. But Georgetown's had some bad losses this year. They, they sure have. If they stay disciplined, they'll end up winning. But if they get undisciplined, Belmont's going to shoot this. That was my wild out. card act. And uh, from Tennessee, I, I hope know, it happens. I don't know how many in our pool went with that one. but um, I haven't checked. But, um, but, you know, I guess my take um, you can follow me at MC Hodges. That's a. Uh, at MC Hodges, I, I'm just like Blair. I uh, I, I typically follow. I, I, I shoot out a couple tweets every now and then when with stuff I'm passionate about. But uh, you know, like I alluded to before, um, one thing I'm excited about I'm taking a uh, taking a trip with my dad and my brother to Atlanta next weekend to uh, to see the the Sweet 16 in the South and the Elite Eight in the South, and really looking forward to that. Last time we did this, we went to Memphis in uh, 2000. Well, it was the year Carolina won it all. I think it was 2008. Uh, 2008 or 2009, I can't remember exactly, but we actually ate uh, 
eight uh, barbecue at uh, the rendezvous Love. in the same oh in the same room as the uh, North Carolina Tar Heels. So that was uh, that was super neat. And so I will say, if you live in Nashville, if you live in anywhere where the NCAA tournament is going on, yes. do everything you can to go to a game. It's great watching it on television, but it is the best tournament atmosphere. It's the best game atmosphere. These kids, this is the absolute last game they're going to play if they lose, and they give it all most of the time. So. Uh, I'll leave y'all with that. And, uh, now, who, who's the possible matchups? Kentucky will probably be there. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, well, let's see here. The possible matchups you could see Kentucky. Uh, you know, definitely will make it. I believe uh, Duke. Duke could make it if they could get out. Of, if they can get away from their second round game, Baylor looks like a, a good team to get there, as well as Indiana. Indiana did lose uh, one of their senior guards to an ACL injury in the Big Ten tournament, but. Um, That'd be really neat to see an Indiana Kentucky rematch as well as a as a game against Baylor or Duke yeah. for Kentucky. So uh, Big Blue Nation is going to be uh, alive and well in Atlanta. It's going to be a, a great SEC country to to have that regional. And uh, one other thing, I will uh, give a shout out to my uh, uh, to one of my friends. We um, he called me. Lives in Kansas City. Uh, Brent Taylor calls me this week and says, well, uh, I know you're a huge Carolina fan. I'm a huge Kansas fan. There's a good possibility they're going to be playing a, an Elite Eight game in St. Louis, and I've got tickets. Want to go? Ooh. <laughs> well, I'd love to be in St. Louis, but I'm going to be Atlanta. I'm going to be excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you can follow me at P. Shane Bailey. And, and you know, I'd, I'd hate to end the con- the podcast on a rant, so I won't throw Comcast under the bus anymore than I already have. Uh, on this podcast and I really don't have anything else other than I'm just excited that the basketball is here I I hate that work interferes I think that it needs to be a national holiday uh, that Thursday or Friday I don't care which day but one of those two days needs to be a national holiday where you can't work because all I've done today is gone from one business to another business to my office to a meeting and barely catching an update on the games and and that's not what the first day of the NCAA tournament is about for me yeah. um, but I'm glad to be working so with that <laughs> unless we could get some sponsors here that could let us go to these games and we could do some live remotes we would love to do that um, that would rather I would rather have that as an option for my first day than a national holiday if I had my druthers so with that guys we're going to call this podcast done <laughs>